evening, uh, wherever you are. Welcome to, de to today's Stats Cafe. Some of you, like me, may have been a little bit confused as it's actually a Wednesday and not a Monday, uh, but we moved to this week's Stats Cafe to a Wednesday due to uh, holidays and Easter, but we're all here for today. So fantastic to have everyone joining us. And I see more and more people joining as we go on. I didn't want to delay the start because we've got lots to get through today. So as we all know, it's been just over two years since WHO declared the COVID-19 a pandemic. And unfortunately, it's very much still with us today. Although fortunately now we have several vaccines and new treatments, but there still remains the question of just how many people have died as a result of the virus. And we can see on this slide here that the importance of this issue is so apparent today, just from all these different newspaper headlines looking at the topic. Since the beginning of the pandemic, over 6 million COVID-19 deaths have been reported globally. However, Recent estimates predict that the global excess deaths may actually be two to four times higher than those officially recorded. There remains debate around these estimates. Being able to ascertain the true impact of COVID-19 on human lives is critical for informing resource allocation and assessing the effectiveness of public health interventions as the pandemic evolves and as it is very much still evolving. However, many countries still lack functioning civil registration and vital statistics systems to provide accurate, complete and timely data on deaths and causes of deaths. Furthermore, the differences in low countries test and report COVID-19 deaths make it very challenging to measure the true loss of life from the pandemic. Demographers, data scientists and epidemiologists have turned to the estimation of excess mortality to try to understand just how many people have died as a result of COVID-19. And you'll hear more from our first speaker today on what excess mortality is and how it's estimated. Over the course of the pandemic, we've seen also a range of innovative approaches to estimating excess mortality, from the use of satellite imagery um, of burial sites to complex machine learning models. However, as the pandemic has progressed, we've also seen a rise in mistrust in official data, the rise of armchair epidemiologists and misinterpretation of COVID-19 statistics, fueling the polarised political narratives of the pandemic. On the positive side, this is also increasing interest in statistics among a general pub and there's an increasing interest in statistics from the general public and it's actually helping to actually change what's been in the past often a negative relationship with numbers however data literacy hasn't quite caught up and that is perhaps one of the most essential weapons that we actually have to fight against covid misinformation and we've seen a lot of good and a lot of very bad examples of how data has been communicated over the course of the pandemic. But it often falls to the responsibility of data journalists to help the general public understand the statistics. And that's why we're really also delighted today to have joining with us a data journalist who's going to actually share her insights on how we can engage the public in COVID-19 statistics whilst maintaining trust in data and tackling misinformation. So the objective of the Stats Cafe today is to actually share a snapshot of some of the varied approaches taken by countries and organisations to produce estimates of excess mortality, as well as uh, providing a journalistic insight on best practices on reporting the data. So we'll hear from a representative of WHO from three countries and from a data journalist. There'll be an opportunity at the end for you to ask questions so as we go along as usual please do post any questions in the chat bar and now it's my pleasure to hand over to Chloe Harvey who's working on a, in our civil registration and vital statistics team here at UNESCO and she's going to moderate the rest of the session and introduce our great speakers thanks very much Chloe over to you Thank you uh, very much, Rachel, for providing your welcoming remarks and good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone attending the Stats Cafe today. My name is Chloe Harvey and I'm um, working with the Population and Social Statistics section um, within the Statistics Division of UNESCO. And it's a pleasure to be the moderator for today's session. I'm very excited about the fantastic lineup we have um, of speakers today. 
Before starting, I'd just like to run over a few housekeeping reminders. Um, we are using a new modality for the Stats Cafe where everyone's mics and cameras are automatically turned off to reduce the background noise. Um, this meeting will also be recorded and the video will be made available on the Stats Cafe website by the end of today. Please do feel free to post all of your questions and comments into the chat box and we will come back to them towards the end of the session during the Q&A section. Um, the slides have also been added to the Stats Cafe website, so in case the connection is bad, you can also access the PowerPoint slides from there. So now I'd like to introduce our great speakers for today. Our first speaker will be Mr. Steve McFeedy, who is the Director of Data and Analytics at the World Health Organization and is based in Geneva. So thanks for joining us at this early hour, Steve. Um, before joining WHO, Steve was Head of Statistics and Information at ONCTAD, and prior to joining the UN, he was a Deputy Director General at the Statistics, Central Statistics Office in Ireland. Then we have Professor Thomas Moultrie, who will be providing his insight on estimating excess mortality in South Africa. Um, Tom is a Professor of Demography and Director of the Centre for Actuarial Research at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. He is currently chair of the technical advisory group of the UN interagency interagency group for statelessness estimation and has been deeply involved in the development of the system that has tracked excess mortality in near real time throughout the COVID pandemic in South Africa. The next speaker will be Ms. Helen Hur, who is a design analyst in Stats New Zealand's population insights team, deriving and delivering official demographic statistics. Helen has over 10 years of experience at Stats New Zealand and a wide knowledge of demography, including improving methods for life tables, leading population estimates and proje projections production, and developing new methods for family and household projections. Then we have Dr. Shubash Shanda, who is the head of the Survey Research Centre and Centre for the Burden of Disease Research at the Ministry of Health in Malaysia. Dr. Shubash is responsible for the planning and implementation of national epidemiological surveys and burden of disease studies. Dr. Shubash is a medical doctor with a master in public health and an MBA, and has also been the national focal person for the WHO mortality and excess mortality estimation. And last but by no means least, it's a great pleasure to have Ms. Rukmini Srinivasan as our final speaker of this event. Ms. Rukmini is an independent data journalist based in Chennai, India, and her work focuses on socioeconomic issues, including gender inequality, health, crime and politics. She was the first national editor of The Hindu and editor for data and innovation at HuffPost India, and is currently the columnist for Mint and India Spend. And since um, March of 2020, Rukmini has also hosted a pandemic podcast called The Moving Curve, which I would also highly recommend as, and is available wherever you listen to your podcasts. Um, Rukmini has just published her first book called Whole Numbers and Half Truths, What Data Can and Cannot Tell Us About Modern India. So we are very lucky to have an excellent lineup of speakers today and we look forward to hearing from you all. But without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Mr. Steve McFeely, who will be providing an introduction to estimating excess mortality. Over to you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. Uh, good morning from Geneva. Good afternoon to Asia. Good evening to anybody else. So let me quickly share my screen. So can you just confirm that you can see the screen? Yes, we can see it well, thank you. Right, so I'm gonna talk very briefly about excess mortality, which is a measure that we use to supplement the, the direct measure of mortality to give, her, to give us a broader measure um, of the impact um, of any crisis, in this case, the COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> Before I do that, I'd like to take a step back. One of the big challenges facing WHO and a lot of countries around the world is that death registrations in a lot of countries um, is, is very poor and in a lot of cases uh, doesn't happen. So nearly 40% of countries register at least 90% of their deaths. Another way of saying that is more than 60% of countries don't. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm, I'm actually recovering from COVID myself at the moment, so I still have a cough. 
So COVID-19 really hit at the Achilles heel um, of WHO statistics in that registrations of death, let alone cause of death, is, is quite a weak statistics. And, and a lot of what we have to do globally is estimate those numbers. So you, you can see <clears throat> on the chart on the right, really only 39 countries around the world produce what we would consider high quality cause of death statistics. Uh, another 78 countries produce so-so quality and 77 countries don't produce any data at all. And that's before the, the pandemic crisis um, hit. Now, as Rachel said in her introduction, um, she gave a very good background and context. So currently at the moment, the official numbers reported to WHO is that 6.2 million people have died directly of COVID. <clears throat> but we know this is a problematic statistic. Um, it's underestimated, but not only is it underestimated, it's it's also problematic for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, it, we've only had this disease for two years, so um, a lot of countries very quickly adopted different definitions, different thresholds when they were trying to assess the impact. Furthermore, a lot of countries changed their definitions on how they assessed COVID mortality during the, the last two years. So even the time series over the last two years isn't consistent within all countries. And for a whole variety of other reasons, from variety of testing access, um, diagnostic capacity that varies very widely across countries. And also we saw that hospitals were overwhelmed during the surges. So a lot of people died outside of the health systems and we don't know um, what they died of. So in short, this is one of the reasons why the numbers that we publish <coughs> on direct COVID mortality needs to be supplemented uh, with, the, with a stronger measure. So the measure we use is called excess mortality. So excess mortality, in this case associated with COVID-19, is a difference between actual deaths irrespective of cause um, in, in a specific place and time against the expected deaths from the historical trend in the absence of COVID-19. And this is really important. So first of all, we don't care in, in this case about the cause of mortality. We're just talking about all mortality. And then we're comparing what what all deaths recorded irrespective of cause against what we expected. <clears throat> so what this measure does is it takes into account both direct but also indirect impact of, of the pandemic. So in other words, people who died of COVID, but people who died of other reasons, but in a lot of cases, that, that other reason was indirectly attributable to COVID either because they couldn't get to the hospital, they were afraid to go to the hospital um, because of, of catching COVID. And all of this adds to the, to the broader impact. <clears throat> There's been some confusion in, in the preparation to our own publication. Excess mortality is not a new concept. It's not a WHO concept. It's an internationally recognized statistical concept, and it's used by all international organizations, including WHO, including academia. And we use it because it's a more comprehensive measure of total impact. So all of the problems that I mentioned earlier about classifications, definitions, while it's a crude measure, it overcomes those problems in that we, we take into account all deaths, whether they were directly or indirectly attributable uh, to the COVID crisis. Now, as I said, what we saw earlier is in about 60% of countries, deaths aren't, aren't well registered. So in this map, what we see is when we look at excess mortality or all cause mortality, we see in the darker shaded countries, basically what, what we might call crudely the developed world, the statistics are generally of good quality. Then there's a tier in the middle, which is green, where we have some statistics. In a lot of cases, it's either subnational or subannual, but they're not complete. And then for a large part of the, the, the world, in particular and uh, the African continent, we see there's really a paucity of data. We use this map um, in our model, so we, we classified countries into three tiers. 
I should point out this is a statistical classification. It's not a developmental classification. And what this classification really talks about is data availability. Um, again, some countries have got a little bit upset that they were classified in one tier or another. This doesn't say anything about the quality of the data in their country. What it talks about is the availability of that data. So if a country has good quality data, but chooses not to make it available, then they're classified accordingly. Um, and I, I say that deliberately because some countries have argued that they have very good quality data, but they've chosen not to share it with WHO. And that's fine, that's their prerogative, but then we can't use it so that they've been classified accordingly. Now, given the complexity of that, so we, we see there's a large chunk of the world where data are missing. So for some countries, we don't have to model. We, we can use the statistics that are already available in the country. But for other countries, we have to model um, to get the estimate. So we built and tested over 300 different covariate models. To help us with this, we also set up a technical advisory board. So the WHO and UNDESA, which is the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, and specifically the, the Department for Population Division, we jointly set up a technical advisory board to, to help us um, design this model. And we have over 60 world-class demographers, epidemiologists, data and social scientists, statisticians from a wide range of backgrounds, geographies. So this is a global group and they've helped us uh, and guided us to, to develop this very complex model. I should stress this is a globally standardized method, but it takes into account country specificity, specificities. So it, it's not a one model fits all. It's a one broad model, but it takes into account a lot of very country specific covariates. So it takes into consideration size, climate, um, population density, the different measures that were taken, the containment measures during pandemic. So it, it's a very, very sophisticated model. And we've now reduced or we're about to launch estimates on excess deaths at global, regional, national level for the 24 months covering January 2020 right through to December 2021, disaggregated by sex and age. The statisticians among you will immediately criticize this chart, but I've done this deliberately. So you see there's no, the, the X and Y axis are not properly labeled. And in fact, I've actually perturbed the data slightly because we haven't published our estimates yet. But what I do want to show, broadly speaking, is the scale. So direct COVID on the left are the the the, the five point um, four million that in, in the first two years that that we've talked about. The Economist and IHME have already published their estimates um, for excess mortality. We will be publishing ours next week. And you can see ballpark where our estimate will be. Um, as I said, I've distorted the numbers slightly, and um, so you'll get the proper numbers next week. But it, it gives you um, roughly the kind of the magnitude or the scale and difference between direct COVID and direct plus indirect COVID mortality. And then finally, just to wrap up, so why why is this important? Well, th there's a number of reasons. First of all, WHO every year produces global health estimates or what you might call global mortality estimates, which looks at overall mortality by cause specific burden. We can't produce those estimates anymore unless we have a, a number uh, of for excess mortality. In turn, those numbers are then used to produce a whole range of health related SDG indicators ranging from premature mortality, neonatal child, uh, maternal mortality, uh, estimates for suicide, road traffic accidents, and so on. So all of the different causes. We also needed to produce other indicators like life expectancy, healthy life expectancy. But also more broadly, you'll probably be aware that there's a lot of emphasis at the moment. A lot of countries are, are now setting up um, preparedness work uh, task forces. And they're trying to prepare, learn, using the lessons learned from COVID on how to prepare better for the next pandemic. 
But one one of the challenges with preparedness is you need some measures of success or failure. So uh, how do you assess whether you're prepared or not? So what indicators are, are you going to assess yourself against? And in fact, what we see is direct mortality is, is one measure, but in fact, it's a limited measure. So again, there's no point in really talking about preparedness if you don't have excess mortality statistics because they're the best measure of assessing whether you are prepared or not. And then finally, we also need these statistics to produce global and regional population estimates. And, and these are critical because these underpin almost every other statistic we use. When you think about per capita estimates, those per capita estimates come out of the global and regional population estimates. So with that, um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Steve, and sorry to hear that you've um, had COVID. I hope you make a quick recovery. Um, it's great to have that succinct overview of the approach to estimating excess mortality. Um, we look forward to the release of the WHO estimates next week. So if you have any questions for Steve that you would like to ask, please do post in the chat and we will ask them during the Q&A session at the end. And now I would like to invite our next speaker, Professor Tom Moultrie, to take the floor. Tom will be providing a technical insight into estimating excess mortality in South Africa. Over to you, Tom. Thank you very much, Chloe, and um, thank you very much to Stephen McFeely, um, who's provided a very useful background and overview to what I'm going to be talking about um, today, um, which is, if you notice on the map, which um, Stephen produced, South Africa is one of the few countries in the developing world which has been able to produce estimates of excess mortality in, South in, re in near real time. And so I want to give us some idea as to how and the processes and the data which have been used to actually generate those estimates. And so that's what my, the subject of my talk is this morning. I'm going to start with a little bit of history and background um, because this speaks to the data which we have available to us in South Africa to track mortality in near real time. And we'll also point to some of the deficiencies in those data. So vital registration of births and deaths and marriages vital statistics began before the start of the 20th century uh, was codified into legislation in 1923 but because of south africa's rather unique political and economic and social history um, african south africans the vast majority of the population their registration of those events was voluntary particularly in rural areas although the process of extending vital registration mandatorily to everyone was extended to all population groups only in 1963. In the 1950s, South Africa um, started building a national population register. Originally, that was seeded from the uh, data collected in the 1951 South African census um, and was then updated through the registered births and deaths um, under the vital registration system. And so we see how we have a national population register, which is uh, continually updated with births and deaths from the civil and vital statistics registration system. Again, because of our history, um, African South Africans were excluded from the National Population Register and only included after 1986. Um, but there, there has been a, ma a massive process of rebuilding that population register, not least with our transition to, demog to democracy in 1994, which is, saw the mass registration of almost all South Africans and the inclusion of, of all South Africans on that National Population Register. Both the vital registration and uh, civil statistics system are, and the National Population Register are overseen by our Department of Home Affairs, our internal ministry. However, the National Statistical Office in South Africa, Statistics South Africa, is mandated to produce um, the official records of vital statistics, the births and deaths um, from the civil registration and vital statistics system, and it's up to them to include the analysis of the cause of death data. And one of the things Stephen McFeely mentioned was often the absence of detailed cause of death data, which is something which we experience in South Africa as well. So when someone dies in South Africa, there's a standard official three-page death notification form, which is divided into two parts. 
The first part, which we call part A, is one page long and contains just the basic information on the, on the person who died, their age, their sex, where they live, where they, um, um, where they died, um, their occupation, if they died during childbirth, etc. The second part, which is two pages long, is the detailed med medical certification of the causes leading up to those uh, deaths. And that part is sealed by the certifying medical officer and is not opened again until the information is processed by Stats South Africa when they do the analysis of the cause of death data. So the family of the deceased takes that death notification form to the Department of Home Affairs, who captures only some of the information on part A in real time, sufficient to enable them to issue a short form death certificate with no cause of death attached to it, other than whether the death was due to natural or unnatural causes, and allows them to issue a permit for burial and cremation. If the person who has died is on the national population register, in other words, they have a South African identity number, that register is updated in real time to reflect that that person has died. But if the person who has died is not on the national population register, that death not notification form is held over entirely for processing by Stats South Africa at the time when they produce their official record of vital statistics. And so there are two distinct issues with our national population register. The first is that not all deaths are notified at all to our Department of Home Affairs. That's something which um, Stephen McFeely mentioned as well. There's a problem of incompleteness of our civil registration system. And secondly, the deaths of those without South African ID numbers are not on the national population register. However, through a data sharing agreement, um, the South African Medical Research Council um, is able to receive each Tuesday a file of the incremental deletions from the National Population Register in respect to the deaths notified to the Home Affairs Department in the Im immediately preceding Epi Week. Our Epi Weeks run from Sunday through to a Saturday. And what we receive is the decedent's ID number, their date of birth, their date of death, sex, the office, the, na the, the name of the office where the notification was given, and whether the death was from natural or unnatural causes. And what we then need to do is we need to adjust those data for three different things. The first is that if we get data on a Tuesday in respect of deaths up until the immediately preceding Saturday, someone who died on the Saturday might not yet have got to the, to the Home Affairs Office to report the death um, in time for the Tuesday run. And so we need to adjust for the deaths which have um, occurred in the immediately preceding week, um, which we often need to allow for delay, further delayed registration owing to public holidays in that week. In this last week, for example, we had a national public holiday from Friday until um, this last Monday. The second issue is that we need to allow for the deaths notified to the Department of Home Affairs, but which are not on the National Population Register. These might be non-South Africans, for example, or they might be the deaths of children whose births haven't been registered. We cannot delete someone from our National Population Register unless they've been placed on the Population Register. Um, and so we need to allow for the deaths which are notified, which are not on the National Population Register. Um, but we can only use information um, which is then Related by Stats South Africa, which is released two to three years after the fact, to try and build a picture of what the extent of those death those um, non um, NPR deaths are. And then finally, we need to ad adjust the data for the incompleteness of the death reporting by age, which we use the information from the official data produced by Stats South Africa, census data, and a variety of demographic techniques to be able to build a picture of the underreporting and incompleteness of death. Um, and so what we use those three adjustments for is to provide an estimate of the true number of deaths occurring any week. And those adjustments overall inflate the NPR deaths by around about 10 to 15 percent, although that varies quite strongly by age, by sex and by region. And we use that information um, of, of a long time series of data from 2014 onwards um, to 
as, as an input into a negative binomial statistical model fitted to the death data from 2014 to 2019, in other words, before the arrival of um, COVID. And we use this trend of the weekly number of deaths, this is the total number of deaths from natural causes in South Africa at all ages, um, from 2014 to 2019, to build a picture, a model of what we think is going to happen in the future years from 2020, 21, and 2022, um, which includes a time trend uh, parameter which um, is designed to um, accommodate opposing effects of population growth which will lead to more deaths all other things being equal and declining mortality which is um, a factor of reducing HIV mortality in the country and so the, the blue line from 2020 onwards here represents our extrapolation from the past time series the gray series there represents our confidence intervals around those estimates but obviously as we go further and further into this epidemic and we are now extrapolating through to 2022, there are going to be issues insofar as we are increasingly uncertain as to whether the historical time trend in mortality might or might not be accurate. And that's something which we need to endlessly consider. When we compare those estimated um, expected number of deaths, which is this orange line running down the bottom here, with our reported number of deaths every week from our national population register adjusted, this gives us our estimates of the, the, the true number of deaths occurring every week. We can see that there are four distinct waves of COVID mortality. And it's, you know, in um, early January 2021, those deaths were around about two and a half to three times higher in that week than we would have expected um, you know, based on the data from 2014 to 2019. And the gap between the, um, the baseline and the observed number of deaths is their measure of excess deaths, which Stephen referred to. We can also present these data by means of what we call a p-score, which is, is a very simple measure. It's, a prob um, it's the measure of the proportion by which the, the observed deaths exceed the expected deaths. Showing here, this is data through to last um, Saturday, 10 days ago. Um, we have the data for the nine South African provinces and our natural deaths. And each the vertical line here represents a 100% increase in the mortality. So if we look at KwaZulu-Natal in January 2021, the, the mortality in that week was around about 300% of what we would have expected, or four times higher. There were four times more deaths in KwaZulu-Natal in early January 2021 than we would have expected, while nationally the number of deaths was um, about 200%, or three times that which had been expected um, based on the historical data which we had. If we compare our officially reported deaths, this is those notified by our Department of Home Affairs um, and our Department of Health, with our measures of excess deaths, we can see that for South Africa as a whole, the number of um, excess deaths is around about three times higher than the number of reported deaths, even though the pattern seems to show a very similar uh, pattern in terms of the waves of the epidemic. But we also see significant differences between provinces. The Western Cape has a particularly good data, health data infrastructure system. And so there's a very good correspondence between their reported deaths in blue and the excess deaths in red. Whereas other provinces like Limpopo, the reported deaths are almost negligible compared to what we have um, observed. And in the case of Mpumalanga and the Northern Cape, they've be recently been through some serious data validation and verification exercises where they've been reporting a whole lot of deaths, which um, probably occurred much further back in time, um, but which are only being notified now. And so we've been able to build a very good picture of the extent of um, COVID mortality in the country. As Stephen said, we don't know all these deaths are COVID, but given that the excess deaths tends to fall very low in between waves, we think that the vast majority, probably 85 to 95 percent of these excess deaths are COVID, and the rest are collateral uh, deaths associated with the overburdening of our health system. So to sum up, um, and this is my final slide, what are the ingredients for a successful near real-time mortality monitoring system in the developing world? The first one is essential. We need a real-time death notification system, and this could either come from a national population register coupled with a national identity system, or a mostly complete near real-time uh, vital registration system. 
It is absolutely essential to have a detailed understanding of the limitations, the inc incompleteness, the deficiencies of those systems, who is likely to be on the National Population Register, or what are the levels of incompleteness in our civil registration system. And we need to be able to get that information in near real time, governed by a data sharing protocol. Desirably, we require political will and high level support in order to be able to produce these numbers. In South Africa, we've been able to utilize the timeliness of the National Population Register, which is updated in real time by our home affairs, in conjunction with a deep historical understanding of completeness, which we derive from our civil registration vital statistics system, which for deaths is somewhere in the order of 90% complete, to build a hybrid system which allows us to track um, excess mortality in a developing country in near real time. And we are one of the few countries to be able to do that. However, it, that last point when I talked about the desirable as ingredients. Um, in South Africa, our ability to produce these near real time estimates of excess mortality has been achieved despite the barriers placed in our path. The obstruction, obfuscation, indifference, delay from our, our various government ministries. There's been an unwillingness to accept um, and to endorse our estimates of excess mortality with the National Department of Health choosing by and large to emphasize their own reported numbers, a third of what we are producing. But despite those barriers, those obstructions, those obfuscations, often some governmental indifference and the delays in getting um, certain crucial data, we have not been able to get information on the vaccination status of the deaths, for example, because of, of um, obstruction and delay from the, our Department of Health, um, who will not provide us with those data, which would be really useful to understand the impact of vaccination on our excess mortality. But despite that, we have been able to achieve something which very few other countries in the developing world have managed to achieve. Thank you very much, Chloe. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, it's also great to see how civil registration and the National Population Register play a significant role in estimating excess mortality in South Africa, and also the importance of accounting for um, incompleteness in registration data. Um, so now I would like to invite our next speaker, Ms. Helen Hur, to take the floor. Helen will be talking about the mortality deficit in New Zealand throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which is something particularly fascinating as whilst most countries globally were experiencing an excess of deaths during the pandemic, New Zealand, among a small handful of other countries, actually, actually experienced a mortality deficit. So over to you, Helen, to tell us more. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. Good morning, good afternoon, and a good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for the opportunity for me to present today um, about the mortality um, in New Zealand through COVID pandemic. Um, it's been quite sad to um, listen to the, uh, um, the other uh, countries that have been um, experienced very high excess mortality over the pandemic. I guess I will show you a slightly different picture from New Zealand. Um, that we are actually ex, um, experiencing the opposite of um, mortality through the pandemic. So just a quick overview. Um, I'll have a quick introduction of the New Zealand's dis registrations, and then I'll talk a bit more on, on the impact on the New Zealand deaths due to the pandemic um, using the statistics and the visual tools. So these registrations in New Zealand um, um, can be regarded as complete, and they are registered in a very timely manner. Um, about 99% of the death registrations, um, about the deaths are registered within one month after they occurred. And only about one in 1,000 deaths will be registered after three months. So I guess we are very lucky that we've got a very timely and uh, incomplete um, death registrations that we can use um, to analysis our death mortality, our death, um, our, our mortality system um, using direct um, estimates. Um, we, New Zealand, states New Zealand usually publish quarterly death um, data six, six weeks after the reference quarters. Um, but since the pandemic starts, um, there are increasing demand for the death publications. So we have um, 
um, established a COVID portal, which published more timely statistics, statistics not just this data, but also other measures. Um, um, the this data will be public weekly, and they will be published about two weeks after the reference week. Um, the cost of this data will also be collected, not by us, but by the Ministry of Health. Um, so, um, the COVID-19 deaths happened in New Zealand um, are minimised due to a uh, quick response of New Zealand, a uh, hard and early response in, for the New Zealand government. The first New Zealand community case has started in, on 28th of February 2020. You can see from the two years um, time, New Zealand only had 62 deaths um, due to COVID-19 of a population of 5.1 million. Um, however, the pandemic <laughs> has been evolving <clears throat> since the start of the Omicron outbreak. <clears throat> um, the case numbers in New Zealand has been shooting up. Um, However, um, and we have changed the death reporting and reconciliation the death tally um, in March 2022. Um, this results in a um, total of 570 deaths um, from on 18th of April 2022. Um, but to be noted, because of the changing of deaths, now this this count includes all cases who died within 28 days of, of being reported as a COVID-19 case. So some of the case, the deaths um, are died with, the, with COVID rather than died due to COVID. Um, so um, let's have a look of the deaths by all causes. This is the COVID-19 data portal that um, we mentioned earlier that we have established after the pandemic starts. Um, the, all, the weekly deaths has shown a clear seasonal impact of, of our New Zealand deaths, like many other countries, that we have more deaths in the winter time um, than summer times. Um, the weekly, uh, um, so New Zealand population, uh, so New Zealand has um, experienced increasing in death numbers in general um, uh, from the history. This is mainly due to New Zealand population growing and aging. Um, between 2011 and 2021, the New Zealand population has grew by 16%, um, while the 16.5 population has grown by um, 39%, while the 85 population has grown by 28%. And, and the proportion of the oldest population has also continued to increase. Um, due to the increasing of the older population, we are expecting some excess deaths. Um, so from the quarterly death counts, um, you can see we have experienced a, a general trend of increasing deaths over time with the seasonal effects. Um, however, in however in 2020 and September quarter, we have not seen any winter peaks, um, which uh, due to the COVID-19 um, responses in New Zealand, which includes um, border controls, um, hygiene, advice on hygiene, social distancing, um, and mask wearing, and all sorts. These, um, these COVID responses have not only reduced, minimized the number of COVID-19 deaths, but also has an impact on the total cost of deaths. Um, similarly, looking at the crude um, death rates, um, 
uh, we do not see the winter peaks of 2020. Um, and 2021 also shows a relatively low rates, um, death rates compared to historical. Um, the death numbers will also be impacted by the age and the sex distribution of the of the population. So we've also looked at the annual standardized death rates. Um, uh, and this graph, the standardized population we used was the mean year population ended December 1961. And we can see clearly in 2020 and 2021, um, we have experienced um, very low death threat compared to historical. These are all evidence that New Zealand are experiencing a mortality deficit during the COVID period. Um, so globally, many organizations have been um, working hard on developing um, message, new method to um, measure excess mortality. Um, and the Human Mortality Database has done a project which visualizes these short-term mortality fluctuations. And they use weekly discounts or death rates um, from 38 countries and um, have made a tool to visualizing how these deaths and death rates are tra uh, tracking over the period. So this is uh, what the visualization tool looks like. Um, so here they have um, the blue line indicates the reference level of the um, of the this data. Um, here in New Zealand, I've choose 2017 to 2019. Um, it's a three year period which smooths away um, the fluctuations of the deaths. And then the type the year here is represented by the black line and um, in New Zealand, I've choose 2020 is at the comparison. And the differences between the blue and the black lines um, indicates the mortality deficit or excess mortality, where excess mortality is um, represented in orange and then mortality deficit in blue. So um, on the left is the death counts. Um, and then on the, on the right is shows the death rates in, in 2020, um, which clearly shows that New Zealand has experienced mortality deficit, especially through the autumn to winter times. Um, um, and then um, um, age specific, Death rates will show a more detailed picture of um, the deaths happened um, through different age groups. Um, about seventy, about about over over a third of the deaths are uh, happened um, at age five plus in New Zealand. Um, and we are looking at the um, age specific death rates through the three years over the pandemic. We can see that um, for eighty five plus. New Zealand has um, experienced a mortality deficit through 2020 and um, 2021. Although 2021 has slightly, the death has slightly increased, but it's due mostly um, experiencing mortality deficit. However, in 2020, the beginning of 2022, um, there there have some evidence showing that um, New Zealand's population of age five has experienced some excess mortalities. Um, to summarize, um, so um, we have consistent findings from um, various direct uh, mortality indicators that 
the maternity deficit, we have experienced the maternity deficit in 2020 and 2021. Um, and there might be some excess mortality in early 2022, but whether the trend is going to continue or um, or not, um, and whether these excess mortality are caused by COVID, um, we will need to wait and see. Um, the analysis of um, mortality needs to include death rates and the preferable age-specific rates which gives a more um, clear picture of what's happening um, exactly. And the timely death statistics will be ongoing demand um, and be useful for any mortality analysis. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Helen, for um, presenting the experience of New Zealand in estimating excess mortality. Um, it was really interesting to see just how New Zealand, um, how the reduced mortality during COVID-19 was at a contrast to um, the international experience of excess mortality. Um, now I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Shubha Shanda, uh, to take the floor um, to talk about estimating excess mortality in Malaysia. Dr. Shubash, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe, uh, and good afternoon, Chloe, and thank you to UNSCAP for this uh, opportunity for Malaysia to share our experience in estimating uh, excess mortality. Give me a second for me to share my presentation. Okay. Uh, that's not coming up, right? Yeah. We can see it. Okay, yes. great. So uh, thank you again uh, and very good morning, afternoon and evening, everyone. Uh, so I'll be ex ex try to give a brief overview of how Malaysia we did it in estimating excess mortality during this COVID-19 pandemic. So as been explained by the earlier speakers, uh, excess mortality is actually quite relatively a simpler, a simple approach whereby it's just observed over expected. And here locally, what we have done is we have taken the observed number of deaths, which is actually the actual reported number of deaths, the ones that we could get as quick as possible. And we compare this with the expected number of deaths. This is the forecast based on five-year historical data that was available, and we use this as the expected number of deaths. So in Malaysian situation here, we have the we are federalized, we have an act which actually requires everyone to register all debts to the National Registration Department. And it's a good thing that we are able to capture almost 100%, it's about 99.5% of our debts are captured by our civil registration system. And on the other hand, the cost of debt and the national statistics are actually uh, compiled by Department of Statistics Malaysia, a completely different ent uh, ent entity on this. So this is a basic overflow of uh, data flow of, of how mortality works in Malaysia. We have uh, very much like how uh, I think a lot of other countries as well, not all our deaths are medically certified. We have deaths that occur in the hospital and deaths that occur outside our health facilities. So for deaths that are medically certified that, that occur in the hospital, all this information is also sent to the Ministry of Health. It is all collated in the Health Information Center in the Ministry of Health. While deaths that occur outside uh, and including the ones in the hospital, all of this, the, an informant who's usually the next of kin is required to register these deaths with the National Registration Department. Now, it is by law that these registrations, uh, to the in, this information to National Registration Department has to occur within three months of the deaths. And on the other hand, the Health Information Center collects from all the hospitals, which includes public and private hospitals here in Malaysia. And it takes about two months for them to get quite a relatively complete data report on this. So uh, the deaths in the hospital account for about 55% of all the deaths in Malaysia, while the deaths outside the facilities are about 45%. So quite a significant amount do not have a cause of death. And Malaysia has adapted a system of doing the verbal autopsies, whereby the Ministry of Health through the District Health Office does the verbal autopsies, which take about six months for them to carry out this. 
before all this information is sent to the Department of Statistics, where data cleaning is done, where uh, data harmonization and, and the final results, uh, the final debt statistics are actually published, it takes up to eight months for, for this to, for Malaysia to produce the results. Now, this is relatively good as we are able to release our the cost of debt statistics within a year uh, of the preceding year. But when it came to determining the excess mortality, we had to make a choice here whereby excess mortality is relatively time sensitive. We didn't want to wait that long before we got our results. We knew that the Department of Stats does a lot of data cleaning and the data would be better. And this would actually be the official source of data, but there was also data limitation and delays in for us to get this data. So instead, we had chosen to move to estimate our excess mortality based on two separate databases which is based on the debts that are all debts that are registered with the National Registration Department. Again, like how I said, because our coverage is good, this is something that we could uh, proceed with. And uh, with also, we, we were looking at the cost of that, of, of all this excess mortality, which we were taking from the Health Information Center. So we had to collate data from two different sources here. And again, I think as how uh, Thomas had uh, explained earlier, I think that a lot of this comes from understanding the data flow, the data, how data works, and the pros and cons, the advantages and disadvantages that work within one's health system. And I think nationally, once you are here, you tend to know how best it works for each and every country. So for expected mortality, on the other hand, we use data from March 2015, uh, and we use that as a training data up to August 2019 with six months period of a validation period to pick which was the best model to utilize. We looked at it in two different models, the ARIMA model and also the profit model. These are both time series forecasting. Basically, we're just forecasting further ahead what uh, historical data. We find which model works the best and this is based on mean absolute percentage errors for us to choose which model we want to use in estimating excess mortality. So a quick overview of what uh, has been found in the Malaysian data was that we had between March 2019, uh, oh sorry, March 2020 up to June 2021. This is about a period of uh, 18 to, no more than that. Uh, it's about a period of 16 months whereby we had a negative excess mortality. So Malaysia actually in the whole of 2020, we recorded a very low number of uh, COVID deaths, which is about 500 deaths for COVID. But it was also interesting to note that the overall all-cause mortality had also dripped, dipped significantly during that period of time. And by having our local data, we were able to utilize it much further when we compared our excess mortality by lockdown periods. We can actually see quite a drastic drip, dip in uh, the excess mortality during each of the lockdowns as well. We were also able to disaggregate the data further based on our local needs here, which is looking at it between medically certified and non-medically certified. And it was encouraging to see that most of the negative excess had come from the medically certified. So the change that was, that with the fact that we do not see a change in the non-medically certified excess mortality was actually a good thing because basically the reduction was not because of a reduction in hospital admissions. The reduction was not because people were not coming to our hospital. And in other words, we can sort of conclude that access to the health care system for acute health services were actually not disrupted in Malaysia uh, during this time period until June 2021. We were able to further disaggregate the data based on age groups uh, where we had negative access for most ages. And we were also based on ethnicities, local ethnic ethnicities here in Malaysia for our uh, analysis. Again, uh, we were also able, because we had the data from the hospitals, this was, of course, a partial data that we utilized, but since we are using this partial data through, through the whole time trend, we, uh, we believe that the, the, pros, the, the increases and decreases would have been about the same, and we would, it's more important to understand the trends rather than the actual uh, quantum of the difference. So it was quite encouraging for us to find that it was the NCDs such as cardiovascular disease and respiratory diseases that actually had a dip, uh, we attribute this to probably lifestyle changes due to the COVID pandemic where people were more at home. And also there was a significant drop seen in respiratory infections probably due to all the physical distancing, mask wearing and all the other effects of the pandemic. So uh, we were in Malaysia, we uh, adapted a way where we had a very good working relationship with WHO. It was a huge thanks to them. 
Uh, the WHO country office and also the WEPRO office discussed with us earlier on the methodology uh, uh, to be able to come up with a nice good method that was agreeable to both sides. We were also uh, fortunate to discuss with Steve Steam uh, from the D Division of Data Analytics in WHO, whereby we found that our estimates were fairly similar to WHO's estimates. This was up to June 2021, and whereby I think Malaysia and WHO have now revised our estimates here based on the locally available data. But I think what was most important to take was that the fact that both our trends tended to be the same, where the dips and the, the highs, it was happening at about the same time. So this was uh, extremely encouraging for, I think, both sides, whereby we were more confident with the results that we were producing. The models that WHO was creating was also supported by actual data on the ground in Malaysia here. And this was a very positive result for both of us, uh, I think from WHO and also for the Malaysian team working on this. So we had already presented our initial results to the top management for them to carry out uh, whatever necessary measure, make the policy changes that are required. And we continue to do regular updates based on our uh, updated results. So currently data cleaning and estimation for July 2021 to December 2021 has just been completed. We are waiting to present that to the higher management uh, and hopefully we'll be able to release it uh, by early next week on the results of this. Uh, this has been a significant period because this is the period where the Delta wave was actually uh, had a very high number of mortality and uh, COVID mortality in Malaysia during this time frame. And that would be quite an interesting results as we publish it soon. So before I end, a quick thank you to my research team members, especially to Dr. Zulfadli uh, from NIH, from Institute of Health System Research, also from Health Information Center, Ministry of Health and Department of Health Statistics. They have been very cooperative in providing us with the data and also Deloitte Consulting Malaysia, who, has, uh, who had helped us out with our analysis as well. So with that, thank you. And back to you, Chloe. Thank you very much, Dr. Shibash. Um... And similar to the South African experience, it was great to see the use and importance of timely national registration data in Malaysia um, for estimating excess deaths. Um, I was also interested to see the mortality rate in Malaysia disaggregated by age um, in those graphs on one of the last slides um, and how in the 0 to 14 years age group, the forecasted mortality rate had actually declined over the co course of the pandemic. Um, and I actually have a question to ask you later. Hopefully we have time. Um, now I would like to invite our final speaker, Ms. Rukmini Srinivasan, to provide her insights as a data journalist on trusting the numbers and tackling COVID misinformation. Rukmini, the floor is yours. Thanks very much for this, Chloe. And it's been a real pleasure to hear um, all the speakers uh, before me. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, India's experience with uh, uh, excess mortality um, and, you know, with a particular focus on the uh, communication of this. Now, this hasn't been entirely a success story, but I think sharing both aspects of it uh, is important. Um, I'm just confirming that my slides are visible uh, and I'll, I'll go yeah, on. We can see it well. So, Thank you. So I just want to start with a little bit um, about the background of um, excess mortality in India and then talk a little bit about uh, the communication of what uh, we in civil society have found. Uh, at the end of India's first wave in particular, which was at the end of by the end of 2020, it was quite apparent that India was uh, an outlier and it's, uh, you know, the, the death rates being reported were, um, uh, you know, defied a lot of um, common knowledge and expectation at the time. Not just uh, in global comparison within India as well, there wasn't good enough explanations about why we, we had seen higher deaths and higher death rates in some states versus others. <clears throat> uh, to my mind, this was really the important question that needed to be asked at the end of uh, the first wave. Uh, I think what ended up happening was a lot of focus on the first question rather than on the second. And now, as we know, in sort of hindsight, um, there were systematic problems with the data. Um, many of the problems with these with the data have been covered by other speakers before me, so I'll just quickly run through them. Uh, India has some of these similar problems. Uh, one is India systematically undercounts uh, deaths from a variety of diseases, as we know from IHME estimates. So this isn't new as such to the pandemic. 
the other issue is that india hasn't yet achieved a 100% mod, uh, 100% registration uh, 100% death registration so this uh, you know there is that missing share of people going into the pandemic as well and the people who tend to be uh, left out tend to be those from more marginalized communities more women tend to be left out so those are important groups to look at um, there's a huge problem with medical certification of deaths even relatively uh, developed parts of the country uh, like kerala in the south have extremely low uh, rates of medical certification of deaths this is just uh, you know an administrative issue that has been allowed to go on very long but uh, could likely have had an important impact on pandemic registration um, there are also pandemic specific reasons although india officially followed the international classification uh, laid out by the who in a, you know at the beginning of the pandemic uh, reporting by me and other journalists in india has shown that um, uh, india recorded next to no suspected covid deaths so all we essentially had were uh, the registration of deaths in which a positive test had been obtained prior to um, uh, the person's death uh, despite this having become apparent in india's first wave there there was no sort of stock taking or you know uh, additional directions to states to include um, uh, suspected covid deaths when this became apparent uh, uh, you know this became particularly apparent in india's uh, truly brutal second wave which happened roughly one year ago um, it became uh, you know increasingly hard to ignore the fact that a large number of deaths were being missed because people were seeing this in their communities um, and the first sort of civil society uh, attempts to do what what has now come to be known as excess mortality estimation in india began then um i just want to go through a couple of uh, sort of very bootstrapped solutions that people in india came up with um a group of doctors in the southern state of kerala came together to scan uh, newspapers which um, typically publish obituaries or uh, uh, news articles about the deaths of uh, people from covid and they sort of uh, compiled these in a publicly available spreadsheet and compared these with official tolls they were able to do this also because the state of kerala was providing demographic information about um, officially reported covid deaths which is not available in many other parts of the country so this sort of cross referencing could go on of course there are limits to this work and when the second wave hit the numbers you know overwhelmed all of india and uh, even newspapers were no longer able to report all deaths another sort of bootstrap uh, solution came up by local journalists who uh, you know uh, demonstrated a lot of initiative and bravery in uh, in small newsrooms across the country uh, they uh, you know often stationed themselves in crematoria or in um, uh, graveyards uh, uh, sometimes counted the number of ambulances coming in and tallied it with official tolls sometimes pulled out physical registry registers of these sorts uh, to sort of compare uh, what they were seeing with official tolls um, what i and other journalists then began to do was to look at uh, crs data uh, since this data has not been made uh, available to us journalists what we um, ended up doing was looking at the information at the level of various states this was possible because of great improvements in digitization of india crs um although the level of coverage varies greatly by states this this is something that uh, journalists were able to do uh, the first city i looked at was the city of chennai and this was done by extracting information uh, from death certificates that were uh, uploaded to the local uh, authorities website um again there were no counts only individual death certificates uh, uh, uploaded as pdfs so we had to scrape this data and come up with these um, early estimates by accessing state level crs data i was then able to look at the first indian state which is the state of uh, madhya pradesh in the center of the country which produced this sort of you know bar chart which uh, which you'd never like to see uh, which clearly demonstrates what happened in the summer in uh, last summer with this huge sort of increase in um, uh, uh, recorded mortality and you know inexplicable for any other reason apart from covid this then became a model that uh, i was able to apply in other states for example the southern indian state of andhra pradesh this same model was then used by uh, journalists across the country this really became a um, collaborative effort the indian newspaper the hindu for instance did the similar exercise for a number of states and was able to show that the level of under reporting varied enormously from states like kerala in the south which had a relatively low undercount factor 
to uh, states like Madhya Pradesh, which I showed had you know large undercounts. So this really became a sort of domino effect of reporters across the country accessing and reporting on this information. One of the other things we were able to do was to attempt to triangulate through other sources of data. So India's national health mission, which covers public health facilities uh, largely in rural areas, over 200,000 of them across the country, it has an administrative uh, uh, data system which uploads information on, say, immunizations and deliveries. I was able to look at this to um, uh, have some sense of, you know, increases in unexplained rural mortality. Uh, while this is not an ideal source of data for mortality, it did allow some amount of triangulation. The, the the data that was that we all put together, we all put it up on GitHub. All Indian journalists together put it up on GitHub, and then it was used by academics to come up with all India estimates. Uh, there are three um, uh, either preprints or published estimates that put uh, uh, you know total mortality, excess mortality in roughly a range of 2.7 to 4 4 and a half million, which in a sense dovetails quite closely with what we're likely to see from the WHO. Um, I do, <coughs> excuse me, want to point out some of the limitations of the data because I feel that it is important to communicate these limitations in order to build public trust. And I think um, many of us journalists have been quite upfront about the limitations of this data. We are not in any way calling this complete information, particularly because it is um, journalists like me who are not uh, trained uh, like the people who've spoken before me to perform you know, uh, complicated maneuvers on the data. So we made the limitations of the data clear while putting the, the numbers out. And <coughs> one of the most obvious problems with it is that registration is improving in India over time, uh, which, which you know, provides uh, difficulties in establishing what the baseline is. Um, and as I said, our, our attitude has been largely to make the data public and allow people to uh, draw their own conclusions. I think the lessons, uh, you know, there are important lessons in terms of uh, uh, data and in terms of thinking about this pandemic and future pandemics, <coughs> particularly for India, which continues to have an enormous uh, difference in administrative and state capacity within regions in India. So what essentially ends up happening is a sort of, in a sense, penalizing of states that do a better job of reporting their data, which, which uh, provides lessons to journalists like me to rethink how we report on inter-regional comparisons. <clears throat> but I do want to focus a little on this last part. Um, a lot of our work has been met with a lot of um, acceptance, trust, and uh, uh, you know, thankfulness, because I think it's hard to underestimate just how brutal India's uh, second wave was. Uh, there, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find an Indian family who doesn't know someone who died in this in the second wave. This really was a, a large number of excess deaths. And in a sense, <coughs> our work did provide a validation and some amount of closure to people who truly were seeking this in numbers, if not elsewhere. But um, just as in the rest of the world, India uh, you know, suffers from an acute climate of polarization as well. And um, uh, I, I would like to think about ways in which we can ensure that this important work across the world does not become victim to this uh, climate of polarization. So you know, what are the ways we can make sure that, um, uh, that we go beyond sort of bubbles in this? Uh, can more data be put up on GitHub? Should we, should we be doing more outreach in terms of making the methodology clear and you know, taking on board um, objections from, from the other side on things like improvements in registration? Um, I also think these, these lessons apply just as much to journalist communication with the government as well, because we have this has become uh, extremely adversarial in India at the moment. And one really wishes it wasn't the case because, um, uh, you know, there is a lot that we can, both sides in a sense can be drawing from each other in terms of coming closer to what uh, what would be a more accurate number of uh, deaths. And also in terms of coming closer to some sort of national closure around what happened a year ago. And of course, it brings me back to um, uh, the point made by Mr. McFeely in particular, which is pre preparedness can only come from a full understanding of what happened, a good accounting of it, and then uh, building on it. So um, these are just some of the lessons that we, uh, you know, are having to learn the hard way right now in India. As you would know, there's also a lot of debate about the upcoming WHO numbers. Uh, but 
uh, just as there are lessons to be learned for future pandemics, I think there are also lessons to be learned about um, bridging divides and building greater trust. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rukmini. That was great. Um, it was great to hear your journalistic insights on excess mortality. Um, and it was also really interesting to hear about the innovative ways that the community um, has been involved in using alternative data sources to estimate just how many people died. Um, and I especially agree with your comment that it's important to explain to the general public about the limitations of data um, so that we can ensure that we instill trust in, in these statistics. So thank you. Um, so this brings us now to the Q&A part of the Stats Cafe. Thank you very much to all of our excellent speakers for your presentations. Um, to our audience, please continue to type any questions in the chat box and please mention the name of the speaker if you wish for it to be directed at somebody in particular. Um, I will start with some of the questions that we received prior to this session during registration and then I'll go to some of the questions in the chat. Um, so one of the first questions, um, I'm going to direct this to Steve. Um, and the question is, I, I think you answered half of this in your presentation, but when will the WHO release its mortality data? And what is the current stage of engagement with the Indian government? Okay, thanks, Chloe. So we'll be publishing our estimates uh, at the end of next week. Um, so not long to wait. In terms of engagement with India, I mean, we continue to engage with all member states. Um, I think it's fair to say the Indian government are not happy with our estimates, and that will be reflected um, in the publication. So th there will be a, an acknowledgement or a, a note stating that um, the Indian government are not content. But I should just add as well, they are, they are the only uh, country at this point that have raised objections both at the Statistical Commission and with us directly at this point. Thanks Steve um, and before you go I have another question for you. Um, can we also apply the methods used in estimating excess mortality due to COVID-19 to natural hazards and disasters or other similar emergency situations? Yeah. Exactly. So th this is exactly the same technique that you could use um, for, for any large crisis. So, um, you know, a hurricane um, or I guess in the Pacific region, the the tsunamis, anything that really d disturbs the kind of normal equilibrium, you, you can use the same methodology. Now, of course, you'd have to develop a different model because the covariates would be different. Um, you know, the, the things that would be important for COVID wouldn't be necessarily the same for say a tsunami um, but again if you had better crvs data you wouldn't need to model so the excess mortality is the right approach it's really a question of how you get those estimates um, obviously we're only modeling because there's a deficit of data um, as we've seen in, in countries like in in, in new zealand um, in malaysia where the government is already producing those data, then you really don't need to model or rely on models as heavily. OK, thank you very much for that comprehensive answer, Steve. Um, the next question I will direct to um, Tom. Uh, and it was a question, um, how to deal with incompleteness of death registration and misclassification of causes of death in estimating excess deaths? Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, we are fortunate in South Africa um, that our civil registration system is largely complete, by which we mean that probably about 90% of all deaths which occur are notified to the authorities. Um, and we have a long history of running censuses and our, and the internal population projection methods, which have allowed us to assess that incompleteness. As I answered in the chat uh, and I pointed out very briefly in the um, in the presentation, um, there is difference um, between the uh, you know, by age. We, we know that the child deaths, for example, are not particularly well reported, um, but we have been able to to build those. Um, into our extrapolations of what we ex our expected number of deaths. Um, 
and that is uh, is clearly um, something which is is important. Um, but the scale of that adjustment overall is that we end up inflating the number of um, national population registered death by around about 10 to 15 percent in aggregate um, across the various um, age groups. So while significant, it's, it's not a huge adjustment. Um, and we are relatively confident in it. Where we're less confident is where the extrapolation into deaths in 2020 through to 2022 happens, because we assume that the continuing trend um, over time is um, maintained, so we, and, and we are worried that that might not be the case. Um, and so that is something which we need to worry. I, um, Briefly, just want to um, throw up on the screen, if I may, um, uh, just the excess deaths by age group, the, the estimate of proportional excess mortality. And what's clear here, you can see again that after age, from ages 40 and over, the excess mortality is very clearly indicative of COVID. It follows the waves, um, the wave four in January 2022, the Omicron wave had much lower mortality. Interestingly, at the ages not to four, in the period of around July 2020, we actually see negative excess deaths, um, which is the period when the country was under hard lockdown, which meant that children weren't, weren't going out, that communicable diseases weren't um, being spread amongst young children. There was something of a rebound after the li lifting of that, um, there was an outbreak of RSV, and now we see a somewhat elevated child mortality. And that is something which we don't have the information on as to what's causing it. And that's where you know, the points to be made about the timeliness of cause of death registration become really, really important. Um, and the accurate recording of cause of death. Um, our system of cause of death is paper-based, and that is um, unfortunately adds to a delay. We should be really moving to an electronic capturing of cause of death. Um, and that might facilitate this. But until we've trained our medical officers better in the certification of causes of death, I think we are going to be running into problems. Thanks, Chloe. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, and then a question for Dr. Shabash. Um, and it's going back to the graph which shows the mortality rate disaggregated by age um, and the declining mortality rate among children aged 0 to 14 years in Malaysia. Um, I just wondered what, what the re possible reasons for that might be. Is it because of a decrease in deaths due to injury or accident or Actually, we do see a decrease in deaths in injuries, but that was actually uh, not that significant in the in total numbers. Uh, as how we said, it was actually more seen among infections, uh, res especially respiratory infection and NCDs. Uh, there were also other infectious diseases. These also dropped, and most of these were actually uh, in line with decrease in hospital admissions as well. So we kind of think these are rather than underreporting more than anything else, it's just total, total reduction or really a negative excess mortality that we are seeing here in Malaysia. The thing about excess mortality is we can't explain why this actually happens. Uh, reduction among especially children and younger age groups uh, has been reported across actually all literature. I think even the one uh, Thomas shared was chose, whereby the children, the younger age groups always tend to have a negative excess compared to the older age group. So this, uh, and I think in, especially like in a country like Malaysia, whereby our population that is elderly, age 60 years and above, is actually about only about 7%. This is compared to, I think, which New Zealand earlier shared was about 16% compared to developed countries, which are above 20%. So with a higher proportion of younger age groups, we actually expect to see a lower and uh, negative excess overall. And probably the negative excess among children per se came from the fact that when the COVID happened, parents were at home. You, we are talking about different cares, reducing uh, accidents that happen at home as well, re uh, not going out so much, with, which exposes them to infectious disease and pneumonia and all this. So I think we believe it's a combination of all these factors that gave rise to this negative excess. OK, great. Thank you. Um, and Steve, sorry, coming back to you. Um, there was a question that came right at the beginning when you were presenting. Um, and the question is about the tier classification shown on the map. 
and the visibility of Pacific in tier classification is not available, would it be attributed to most countries going through the first wave of COVID or unavailability of data? I'm not entirely sure I understand the question, but but the tier classification is simply a reflection of data availability. Um, so it, to build a model, what, what we start with is we build, we look at the patterns in the countries where we have data, and then we have to extrapolate those to the countries where there, we either have no data or partial data. So really all that map is showing that the tiers is, is kind of showing the extent of the problem. So what we really see initially is that we're relying on data from the developed world, if I can call it that. And, and then that's one of the challenges. Then you're, you're then trying to extrapolate that to the rest of the world. And, and that's one of the big modeling challenges. Um, ironically, in the case of India, where, uh, as you've heard, th th there's a, a contestation. We actually have data for 18 of the states, which accounts for about 70% of mortality. So in the case of India, even though it's a tier two country, the model estimates, we don't rely on the model that heavily because about 70% of, of the data actually come from reported data. So that the model is really only estimating um, excess mortality for about 10 states, which are actually quite small. So I don't okay. know if that answers the question or not. Thank you very much. Um, the person who posted that, you can write in the chat if if you would like um, Steve to expand on that. Um, I see some other questions coming up in the chat, but I think that we should probably close the session um, shortly. Um, I don't want to keep you any longer than the allotted time, but if you want, you can continue to post your questions in the chat and hopefully if our speakers um, don't mind and they'll be happy to answer them um, in the chat, that would be fantastic. Um, so I think that's, yeah, as I said, that's I think that's all we have time for today. Um, thank you very much for your interesting questions and to our speakers for your excellent presentations. Um, before we close today's session, I'd just like to briefly wrap up with a few closing remarks. Um, we heard today about the experience of the three countries and the WHO in estimating excess mortality, each taking a slightly different approach to the methodology. And even beyond countries, um, beyond the three countries who presented today, we know that countries have been using other innovative ways to assess the true number of deaths from the pandemic, such as satellite imagery of burial sites or use of obituaries and newspapers, as Rukmini mentioned. But I think one thing that stood out to me and which is pertinent for every country globally is the importance of a strong civil registration and vital statistics system to provide accurate complete and timely data on deaths and causes of death. And there remains a need throughout the Asia Pacific region and beyond for strengthening of civil registration and vital statistics systems to be able to respond um, to future pandemics or crises and to mitigate the human, social and economic effects. Um, as one of the questions from our audience also highlighted, excess mortality is an extremely useful tool that transcends beyond COVID and also can also be applied um, to other emergency situations such as natural hazards and disasters. Um, the exact number of people who died as a result of COVID-19 may never be accurately ascertained, but new developments and methodologies and use of new data sources bring us closer to that figure every day. As highlighted by Ms. Rugmini's presentation, the pandemic has also sparked increasing interest in case numbers, mortality data and trends among the general public, which is fantastic that so many people are now interested in data and I think it's definitely a positive development. Um, however, I'm sure that we have all encountered at some point over the pandemic a rise in armchair epidemiologists popping up on social media platforms with a tendency to sometimes um, manipulate this data to tell a story that aligns um, with their goals. And this incomplete and incorrect data can muddy the waters and the mistrust in data can risk lives. Um, so I think this really points to the need to improve data literacy and perhaps we'll ha have a role as statisticians, demographers and epidemiologists to encourage a deeper understanding of these statistics and to also think about how we're presenting data and how it can be more user friendly yet also reducing the risk for um, misinterpretation. 
Um, so I think that brings me to the end of today's Stats Cafe. I would like to say a big thank you again to our excellent speakers for such an engaging Q&A session and for your amazing presentations. And thank you to all of those who joined us. The recording of the session will be available later today on the Stats Cafe website and the presentations will also be available there. I believe my colleague has posted the link into the chat. Um, and if I encourage that if you want to keep up to date with all the news on civil registration and vital statistics in the Asia Pacific region, please do sign up to our newsletter and we will share the link to that in the chat. Thank you very much and wishing you a nice rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks all for your engagement.